Lord be with you. Good morning. It's good to see everyone, and we welcome you to this service. I thank Alan for playing that song. It's one of my favorites. I listen to it a lot of mornings. Um, you'll never walk alone. Uh, if you really want to see an inspired version of that, Google that with uh, Liverpool Stadium. It's kind of the spiritual anthem for England and also for the hockey, the soccer world over there. Uh, there's children's cookout Saturday morning. Do you need to say anything about that? Uh, at 11 o'clock at the Lion Shelter, which is up by the dog park at Murray County Park. Okay. Um, anybody can come to it. Okay. So, Saturday morning at 11 o'clock uh, at the Lion Shelter, uh, close to the dog park. Uh, any other announcements? We have lunch after this. Um, anything? I guess we just go eat. <laughs> Let us have worship God. Let us unite in affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Be I'm just... Uh, Kind of missed the lectionary this morning, so if you follow the lectionary and wonder what's going on, uh, it's my last Sunday, so I <laughs> switch things around. And uh, I picked two of my favorite Old Testament passages, and, and this first one's from Micah 6, verses 6 through 8, which I think is one of the high water marks uh, in, in the Old Testament. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? And then from the Psalms, there's this... Psalm, I don't know if I've ever even preached under not Psalm 131, but every time I read it, it's, it just gives a sense of calm, and, and I really like it. Oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother. My soul is like the weaned child that is with me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time on and forevermore. Amen. Are there any uh, joyous concerns that people would like to share this morning? My grandson got married last night. Grandson got married. Good. Congratulations. Robbie, how's Carolyn? This is about the same? Okay. Okay. Uh, Carol Anderson's in the hospital. We will remember her. 
Uh, Gerald Martin did get to go home last Tuesday, so we continue to remember him. Barbara Spencer, Mary Kellen, Tim Jones, Olivia Anderson, Norma Powell. Norma got some really good news uh, uh, this week, so she's doing well, but we continue to pray. Pat Anderson and Carolyn Anderson. Our service members and first responders, Isaac Dorning, Chris Tucker, Jesse Owens, Anthony Dory, Daniel Westmoreland, Jason Cruz, Jerry Lovell, Jeff Lovell, Nick McCoyne, Matt McCoyne, Blaine Click, Tommy Henley, Jalen McCumber, Bradford Norton, Michaela Pierpoint, and Matthew Hill. And then our healthcare workers, Cassandra Waters, Jessica Woody, Kendall Hirabara, Sarah Fitzgerald, Shelly Woody, Kimberly, Kimberly Nace, Jennifer Leland, Jessica Bitwork, Lisa Donaldson, Mary Sneed, Tyler Sneed, Chelsea Leonard, Scott Waters, and Lynn Turner. Any others? Let's bow our head. Mighty God, we gather this morning brought together by your love. Your love that is expressed so greatly for us in Jesus Christ and the salvation that he brings. Your love is expressed in the beauty of our surroundings and the many gifts of life to make this life so meaningful and so abundant. And we praise your name for who you are. And we give you thanks for your presence with us as the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us in all that we do and all that we are. And we pray that your Spirit will continue to be with the church, lead us and guide us and empower us. We pray, O Lord, that you forgive us of our sins and give us loving grace to forgive others. We pray for peace in our world and pray that it may begin with us. And we pray, O Lord, for the end of the pandemic. We pray your healing grace will continue to be with the world. Be present with us. Lead us and guide us in all that we do. In Christ's holy name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please turn to page 344 in your hymnal? We're going to be singing, Lord, who have come to the lake shore. Verses 1 and 2 are on the bottom of each uh, staff that's on the page, and then the last two verses are on three and four on the next page, at the very bottom of the page. This is Lord, you have come to the lake shore. Would you please stand if you're able? <laughs>
appreciate you. We appreciate you remembering the church with your gifts. Let us pray. Mighty God, we are richly blessed people and we bring these gifts into the it's an act of love and thanksgiving. In Christ's only name we pray. Amen. First Sunday I was here, I told this joke. But I thought of more of it. Preacher's giving his first sermon. First sermon. And he was very nervous. And he got up, the pulpit was in the center. And Miss Gladys was sitting on the front row, right, right down front. And he came up to the pulpit and he said, Behold, I come, and his mind went blank. Went back, sat down, gathered his thoughts, came up again, Behold, I come, and did it again. Sat back down. The third time he came up, he said, Came up just charging, Behold, I came. The pulpit went over, and he flipped over and landed in Miss Gladys's lap. He was apologizing. He goes, you told me three times you were coming. I should have moved. <laughs> now the part I came up with later is the next Sunday in Sunday school in the women's class, they were kind of giving her a hard time about the preacher doing that. <clears throat> she said, that's all right. I ain't had a young man in my arms in 40 years. It's pretty good. <laughs> So when she went to church that morning, in her normal spot, four other of the women were lined up. <laughs> On this Sunday, I want to thank God for His grace. Um, I'm basically a shy person who has trouble talking, uh, and I couldn't do this without Him. And so I, I am very thankful for God and His grace. I thank Linda. For her love and support. Uh, she had to listen to a lot of stuff after meetings, a lot of stuff. And, and she gave great guidance, uh, told me when to be quiet and when to speak up more. And, and she could tell me when the sermon was time to quit. Uh, she had this look. <laughs> Try to get people to sit in front of her sometimes. So. So I wouldn't say that, but I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate the, my family and the support they gave me and the sacrifice. Uh, uh, two of our children are here, Jeff, son of Kyle, is a, a detective in, in Dixon County. He couldn't be here, but uh, Jerry and Jenny and, and five of our grandchildren are here, and I appreciate their love and support. Um, we got friends here, and I appreciate that as well. I've served nine churches under nine bishops, uh, 13 district superintendents, and three of those district superintendents uh, had preached at this church, Ben Alexander back in the 50s, and then uh, Gary Taylor and, and Larry Lane also. I've had seven secretaries and saved the best for last, and I appreciate Michelle and all she has done. And the people at the churches uh, that have so blessed us and loved us uh, at all the different churches. Um, there are so many stories, and some of those stories are going to find their way into print. Uh, I will change the names and some of the situations a little bit. Um, but I appreciate so much the love and support that people have given me over the years. So I want to get that out of the way first. Um, the, the gospel lesson this morning, I told you I changed the orders around. Uh, this is really for next week, but I'm doing it this week. What are y'all going to do to me? <laughs> um, our gospel lesson is Mark 4, 35 through 41. On that day when the evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was about already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushions. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was dead calm. 
And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they filled with a great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Amen. Let's pray. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. At the America's Cup dinner in Newport in September of 1962, President Kennedy said this, We are tied to the ocean, and when we go back to the sea, whether it is to sail or to watch it, we are going back from whence we came. There is a decorative quote that said, I need vitamin C, S-E-A. A lot of people find that in the summer and they take off. And Jacques Cousteau said, The sea, once it casts its spell, holds one in its net of wonder forever. I move this text from next week because it's a favorite scene for me of Jesus in the boat with the disciples. Interestingly, this is the, the, the text for my first sermon here at, at Riverside in, in June 21 of 2015. And I've changed some of the words around a little bit since then. Apparently, Jesus liked the sea. I scanned through the, the first eight chapters of Mark the other day, and there's 11 mentions of Jesus going to the, to the sea or to the lakeside, as it's called, because it's really a big lake. It's about seven miles across, 13, 14 miles long. And Jesus crossed it four times. Doesn't say why. But in chapters 4, 5, 6, and 8, Jesus said, let's go across the river, or go across the lake, and they did. Uh, I remember in, in seminary, we had a course on the Gospel of Mark, and Professor Donahue said, I want you to read through this, and say, I never did find anything about why. It just, every once in a while, he said, let's go across the, the sea. And I think there may be several reasons. He grew up in Nazareth, kind of up a little bit in elevation from, from Capernaum and the Sea of Galilee. I don't know that he'd ever been down to the sea before. Perhaps he had. And I think he was entranced by it. And so every once in a while he just said, okay boys, let's go across to the other side. I think it was a time of rest and relaxation for him. Some time to just be with friends, uh, to tell stories, to laugh. Uh, I have this scene imagined where the first time they're getting in the boat and going out on the Sea of Galilee, and Matthew, tax collector, he hadn't been to the sea. Most of the other disciples had, only four of them said were fishermen. And Matthew stuck, stepped down and the boat started moving, and he was really nervous, and when they put out, he was nervous. And so uh, this, this kept uh, going, and they kept teasing uh, him about this. And the third thing is, I believe that there was a spiritual connection akin to what President Kennedy said. There is a, somebody said it ought to be called, uh, earth should be called water or ocean, because we're mainly water, and I think it's, we're like the same percentage of water in our bodies is in the oceans or in the seas. And so there's, a, there's this connection between us, and I think Jesus felt and knew that, that spiritual connection. The average depth of the sea is 84 feet. The maximum is 181 feet. And I tell you that because it's not as deep as a regular sea or ocean, and therefore the wind, when it hits, it can stir up the waves a lot more easily. Uh, Lynn Hill told me when we were in Israel of being on the Sea of Galilee one time, the first full day we're there, you get on a boat and you go out and see a Galilee and cut the motor and, and, and you look at Capernaum and all the places. Uh, he said they were out to see a Galilee and all of a sudden a storm hit. Well, the, the topography is these hills that ring the Sea of Galilee and the wind comes from the Mediterranean and all of a sudden it's up over those hills and, and there you got a storm suddenly. A storm hit that night as they crossed. Remember, at least there were four fishermen in the group, uh, and they were afraid. 
must have been a big storm. You can also remember that these other guys weren't used to the, to the sea or storms at sea, and that must have terrified them, and they feared for their lives. Uh, let me share these points about this. Like the disciples and Jesus, were in the same boat. Now, the boat that they were in was about 27 feet long. Uh, in the 80s, there was a drought, and the Sea of Galilee receded, and they found it uh, uh, buried in the banks a first century boat. Uh, they dated it, and it's put together with pegs, there's no nails in it, and it was pretty well preserved. And they've got it where you can go see it now. Um, but it gives you an idea of what they were in when they went fishing. G.K. Chesterton said, we're all in the same boat in a stormy sea and we owe each other a terrible loyalty. The boat has been the symbol for the church since the early days. If you look at the sanctuary before church architecture got different uh, from the narthex to the chancel area, this long center part is called the nave. It's from the Latin navis, which means boat. Uh, when we read uh, in the Gospels, the accounts of the boat, we should associate that with the church. When Jesus gets in a boat or does something in a boat, it, it's about something about the church, and we need to pay attention. World War II area, the World Council of Churches, uh, their symbol, their Christian symbol, uh, was a boat with a cross for a mast. Jesus and the disciples are in the boat. That's 13 and yet maybe 14. Rembrandt did a painting called The Storm on the Sea of Galilee. He painted 14 people in the boat. And looking right at the, the viewer is the terrified face of Rembrandt showing what they were experiencing. As followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be reminded that we're all in the same boat. A solitary Christian is a contradiction. Our faith is seldom bolstered when we remove ourselves from fellowship. That's for individuals. We also need to look at the church larger scale. Um, at the denominations. I can imagine the Lord being very happy over our talk of, of splitting of the United Methodist Church. I read with sadness the other day of the churches that have disassociated themselves from the United Methodist Church. There were six or seven conference-wide. I think one district had four of them. I don't think that's what the Lord wants. Too much of the dissension and the dissatisfaction uh, of the church today is personality-driven. There's a lot of egos involved. And usually when there's a split, there's somebody that's leading that split. There's some ego or personality involved. We're all in the same boat. And these ideas that are selfish, more could be done in church if we realize the commonality of who we are. And this is addressed as a human family as well. We cannot live to ourselves nor be oblivious to the needs of our brothers and sisters in the world. God forbid when we let our faith belittle or discriminate or ignore someone that's in pain. Note that Jesus said, let us go to the other side. For the first time, Jesus leaves the Jewish section of Galilee for the predominantly Gentile coast. We will be strengthened as a people of faith when we embark on missions to the other side, to those who are different from us, those that we don't like, those whom we don't know either. We're all in the same boat. It's us and it's all. When they were underway, a storm hit and they were terrified. President Kennedy had on his desk a Breton fisherman's prayer from a poem by Winfred Ernst Garrison. It said, Oh God, thy sea is great, and my boat is so small. Storms hit in life, there's no way to avoid them. They are the result of living life. And in the church, a living life of faith. Now they can be minimized. The disciples could have stayed on the shore. They could have stayed there as Jesus went across to the other side. They could have gotten in a boat and kept it on the shore. That had been kind of silly uh, while Jesus went to the other side. But if they, were put into, if they were to put out into the deep with Jesus, 
Storms are a possibility. And storms do come and they do hit the church. We like storms at a distance. We like the image of being in a mountain cabin and looking out over the valley and seeing the storm come through and the thunder and the lightning and the rain. We like that. We like to watch storms in human drama. We watch them on TV, crime dramas and, and other dramas, the storms that play out in people's lives because we're watching from a distance. We even find humor in the storms of life and the little terrors, like the little girl that's terrorized by her brother Donald with a cat. I heard that story this week. Some of them know what I'm talking about. And we see the humor in, in black humor like MASH. It takes place in a, in a dreadful situation of the, the Korean War, but they find the humor in it. As long as we're not in those storms. Franklin Roosevelt said, a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. The experience of the storm and the sea help us improve and develop Life of the ministry and life of the church, you're going to have storms at hand. Uh, we literally did at Aldersgate when it tore the roof off, just messed up the church. But there are other storms that hit the churches. But living through those and living through those in faith is what strengthens us for who we're to be. We can avoid some storms as Christian people by staying close to home, by not venturing far. But that's not what Jesus said. In Luke 5, verse 4, after Jesus was teaching from, from Peter's boat, when he got through, he said, put out to the deep, catch some fish. Put it out to the deep. Walt Whitman said, sail forth, sail for the deep waters only. Storms can be avoided by not venturing out, or storms can be stilled when we realize that Jesus is in the boat with us. But if you're in the boat with Jesus, it's going to be out in the deep and there's the potential for the storms. He is in the boat with the disciples and when he awakens, he stills two storms. He calms the wind and the, and the, and the, and the seas that are rough. But he also storm, stills the storms that are in their hearts, that what's going on with them. And we need that stilling of the storm today. There is an old hymn that I would like to sing this morning, but I won't. Uh, it's by Marion Baker. It's called Peace Be Still, and it's found in the old Cokesbury hymn. Uh, and in many churches uh, where we had a Sunday night service, we would sing this occasionally. Master, the tempest is raging. The billows are tossing high. The sky is overshadowed with blackness. No shelter or help is nigh. Care us not that we perish. And it moves into the chorus. The winds and the waves shall obey thy will. Peace be still. Peace be still. Whether the wrath of the storm-tossed sea, or demons, or men, or whatever it be, no water can swallow the ship where it lies, the master of ocean and earth and skies. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace, peace be still. It's a profound theological statement that Jesus calms the angry sea. When God created the earth in Genesis 1, one of the first things he did was to calm the seas and gather up the, the waters. And the, and the sea and the waters symbolize chaos in ancient literature. And we says God's calmed them and brought them and put them in their place and calmed them, and saying that this is a God of creation who has power over whatever chaos comes in life. He is the Lord of creation. And so it's a, it's, it's a great theological statement to say that Jesus is over these, these stormy waters that come. And so the disciples asked, and they were filled with awe, and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? And there is awe and reverence as they're beginning to, or continue to learn who this Jesus is that they're in the boat with. You can do an interesting sermon dealing with the questions that are in this passage. There's four or five of them, some of them double questions. But there's one that hangs in the air and, and kind of haunts us. We want the calming of the stormy season life. 
We want Jesus nearby to calm them. But not the question that follows, the double question that follows. Why are you afraid? Have you no faith? And that question stays with us today. Why are you afraid? Where's your faith? A boat, a sailboat may move in one of three ways. It can drift. There's many churches that drift today. It could be rowed by the disciples. Remember, this is a 27-foot boat, an angry seas. That's, that's a pretty hefty job to be uh, steering that by rowing it. Or it could lift up its sails and catch the wind. May we examine our faith. May we remember the mass of the earth and the sea that's in the boat with us. And let's put up our sail as a church let God's holy wind move us. Amen. Our closing hymn for the North morning is going to be number 593 in your hymnal, Here I Am, Lord. We will sing all verses, and will you please stand if you are able. Amen. By the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save, I who made the stars of night, I will make
a while ago that my uh, brother and sister and families are here, and so I'm glad they're here supporting me as well. Uh, let's bow our heads. Oh Lord, for the meal we're about to receive, we give you thanks and for the abundance of blessings of who you are. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and love of God and fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.